Now you have a chance to enter the conversation. We wanted to leave plenty of time for you to do that. And um, if you would be so kind uh, to come to this microphone in this aisle here, and um, if you would just state your first name, that would be wonderful. Uh, we promise not to track you down, but uh, if you just state your name, and uh, if you would, make your questions uh, as brief as they can be so that both of our friends here can uh, have an opportunity to answer. Um, so we'll take the first question. Um, Steve, this is more for Matt, I think, because one of my questions has been for many years, how does an, it seemed to me that atheism required more belief than, than maybe even belief in God, except hearing what, you're, what you said about these three big questions, I think I get an idea because you said something that, that lacks evidence and lacks a reason. And so I guess that's my question for you. Um, you. You say that the soul and the lack of God both lack evidence and reason. And from my perspective, especially with the Big Bang Theory, with so many miracles throughout the millennia, uh, the afterlife experiences that have been have a vision of heaven that has been fairly consistent for thousands of years, it seems to me that the circumstantial evidence is very great that there exists an afterlife and that there exists God. And how do you, how do you deal with that? Sure. I, I don't know if this is possible. Is it possible to bring house lights up just a little bit? Because like right now he's just a dark shadow. And I, yeah, I, I agree with that. I'd that's love to see my faces. natural state. Yes. <laughs> You're like a black hole, all of the lights be sucked out. So yeah, so to start with, you, you started with something which I'll paraphrase as I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And it's even the title of books, and it's understandable because in part there's confusion. As a, no matter what label you put on it, and I don't want to get into a, a, a disagreement about labels, at the end of the day, someone is convinced that a God exists, and I am not. This is not a positive belief this is not a faith-based position. It's just, I am not convinced. And in some cases, I may be convinced that they're wrong when we talk about the, the, the conflict between what we know about the self and the soul. With regard to the things that you hold as strong evidence for the afterlife or supernatural, et cetera, um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to make sure I phrase this in a way. Near-death experiences are commonly cited. You referenced it slightly. First of all, that's near death. Second, death is a process. It's not that we clearly understand or define anything. And third, while you can pick out experiences that seem consistent, uh, they're not all consistent. People tend to see the religious iconography that they grew up with, and they're not exclusive to Protestant or Catholic or even Christian. They, people will see various things depending on how they were, what beliefs they were raised with. And given that, we know that not all religious claims can be true, but they could all be false. And so if I don't have a way to tell the difference between you know, a Hindu who has a near-death experience and explains something, or two different Protestants who do it, plus we've, we've found some people who are lying. In, in, in recent years, there was a case that was incredibly popular that was touted all over, and then we discovered that it was entirely fraudulent, and they acknowledged it. Um, and this ties into the thing you were talking about, the miracles that have happened all over the place. Uh, you, you, you may think that I'm just being obtuse. I am aware of no miracles that have ever occurred and been confirmed with any... I'm, I'm aware of plenty of claims of miracles. But by their nature, um, I don't have a time machine. I don't have a way to investigate them. They're not reproducible. They don't fall within the realms of what we can actually put forward as a testable claim. And so if your claim is unfalsifiable, there's no way to show that it's false, it just... It has no epistemological foundation. There, there's essentially no way we can get from, hey, this happened. Like, even if you told me that you had this amazing experience, that you were in your room and a ghost of a loved one came to you and gave you information that you didn't have and it bore out. My position on that is I'm willing to believe that you are honestly relaying an experience that you had to the best of your ability 
I'm just not convinced that your conclusion is justified, given what we know of waking dreams. And, and by the way, when I was, things in, very, things in different churches are going to be different. Um, ghosts, when I was raised as a Southern Baptist, those were demons. Because once a soul passes on to heaven, they're not going to come back down and, and talk to you and interact like that. They're up there living a joyous, sin-free life with or without maybe free will or whatever else. As we go through the claims, we have yet to come across any claim of a miracle or something supernatural that has been reliably confirmed and established. If we had, we would have already had a Nobel Prize for discovering the supernatural, or we would, you, the Templeton Foundation would stop testing prayer all the time and finding out that it works at the rate of chance, and worse, if the people know they're being prayed for. When we do these sorts of proper studies, the supernatural fails to come forward. This is not in any way confirmation that the supernatural doesn't exist. This isn't a disproof, which is why when I say I'm unconvinced, I'm not sitting here saying, ah, the supernatural is hogwash. I don't, that's garbage. That's not my position at all. The things that you might find compelling, I don't. And that's where the conversation needs to start in figuring out why one of us finds something compelling and the other doesn't. Because one of us is wrong. And I'm not saying which one, I'm just saying I have yet to see. I mean, people call into the show all the time and say, oh, this happened, great. If somebody makes a prediction and it comes true, what do you know? You only know that they said something and later it happened. You don't know how, you don't even know if they knew. Could have been a, could have been a lucky guess, could have been a, a reasonable inference, and, depending, and they're never particularly specific. Um, but the confirmation that somebody predicted something and it happened doesn't tell you how it happened. Time machine, gods, ghosts, spirits, lucky guess, whatever. That is work that still needs to be done. And while I understand that there's a framework that you and others and I used to feel explains these unknown things, I'm just, I don't think there's an explanation there. I, we tend to explain things in terms, the unknown in, in terms of the known. It, it's something that increases our understanding. And so when we have things that are unknown or mysterious, if we try to explain them in terms of a bigger unknown, then we're trying to solve a mystery by appealing to a bigger mystery. The God hypothesis has no explanatory power because it does not increase our understanding of how it happened. It is indistinguishable from saying it's magic. And until you can show me the difference between God did it and it's magic, I can't pick between the two. I can't even pick between a third option of universe creating fairies. As preposterous as that may sound. Steve, thank you so much for your That's question. Nice. Uh, there is a, just a plug, uh, to put a plug in for a book, John Burke here in Austin Gateway Church wrote a book called Imagine Heaven about okay. near-death experiences. Pretty fascinating. Ties it biblically. It's a very fascinating book. Uh, just before we take the next question, Michael, any response that you would like to make uh, to the question? Just wait. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably hold off for now. Okay, good. All right. And I will try to give shorter oh, answers. Yeah, you, <laughs> I'm bad at that. Sorry. I can be too, so I'll, I'll give one long one for that so one. So our next question. Hi, good evening. My name is Michael Lynch. Uh, sorry, I'm a high-functioning autistic. Sometimes it gets very difficult for me to get sentences together. Yeah. Uh, but I've ran this through my head many times. Yeah. Um, Matt Delahunty, uh, I could not be the person I am today without this gentleman right here. Yeah. Um, I became a born-again atheist at the age of eight. The reason I say born-again is because we're all born atheists. We're taught religion and we're taught hate. And it, that just depends on what part of the world you're born in. Uh, but what got me to the point that I'm at now is asking questions. Questions lead to answers. The more questions you ask, the more answers you get. The biggest difference between an atheist and a theist is we have no limits to the questions we can ask. So the questions allow us to get to more answers. That's why the most successful scientists in the world are atheists. We have no limits to our questions. We keep continuing to ask and answer questions until we get mm -hmm. to answers. I, I'll be the guy who asks you to actually yes. get to the question. And sorry, avoid sorry, sorry. The sermon. Uh, I was, um, I was I, trying to be nice. No, to no, no, no. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> we messaged earlier, and he knows yes, we're yes, going to yes, talk so later. Was, so. um, I do apologize. Yeah, it's, go ahead. it's many, many, many things. So yeah. basically, I just wanted to uh, share how I got to where I was, and I would like to get feedback from both yeah. of you, really briefly. So. Um, by asking questions and my solid understanding of chemistry, 
physics and astronomy, I combined those three to pretty much answer every question you could think of. Uh, because chemistry is the basic, its basic um, definition is any matter made of substance. Any matter made of, uh, any substance made of matter, I'm sorry. And then physics is just the movement of matter. Uh, astronomy is the mass, it's what you see, the, the mass, if you take the, the atom, but what you see in the universe makes it easier to put together once you understand astronomy. Um, so by answering, asking questions and answering questions with those three, uh, getting to truth, absolute truth is, objective truth is true whether you believe it or not, a personal truth is, oh, that's good enough for me. And then a political truth is just a truth that's been said. So many lies. We, we really exactly. need a question. Exactly, but yes. Uh, oh, sorry. If I, that's enough for me, I would just like to get your feedback on that because I could continue to go and go and go. So, so your question? Just tell me your question. I would like to get feedback from both of you on what I just said. On science and astronomy? Uh, and how... It's, Sorry. Uh, you can do it. Go ahead. What is it? it well, I, it's so much to say in so little time. Um, you, you, go let ahead. Me, let me see if I interpret it correctly. It sounds yes. like you want response from both worldviews yes. about the world that we live in. I mean, about reality, about science and all that. So let, let, can we take it that way? Sure. Okay, good. You want to go first? Yeah, I sometimes I'll get accused of advocating for scientism that science is the only way of knowing. Um, that's actually not my position, though it's not necessarily too far from that, because for me, very simply, science uh, is a collection of methods that are the most consistently reliable methods to accurately understanding reality. Science doesn't make proclamations about truth, absolute or otherwise. It simply takes observations, constructs models that serve as the best current explanation and it is always tentative, and it is subject to revision. Uh, this is probably one of its marked differences between science and, and a number of other philosophies and religions, in, in which case most of those would try to discover a truth that then is, is static. This is the way things are, and the way things have been, and the way things always, have, always will be. That may be true for some things. Uh, I'm not necessarily convinced that's true for everything. So while I am absolutely reliant on scientific methods and find them reliable, I also recognize that uh, science can't prove that I like chocolate ice cream better than vanilla yet. It, it may, through fMRI stuff at some point, show that. Um, and so there are experiential things as well. Where skepticism comes in is in recognizing that I may not be able to escape my own biases and my own perception. And this is where science leaps in to say, what we need is independent confirmation. You know, if I think I saw a ghost and I was the only one there, the only conclusion I can come up to is that I had some experience that I cannot explain. If we could get into other people to in independently investigate this and come to similar conclusions, now we're getting somewhere. And that is where you move beyond just the experience to something that's closer to science. And, uh, you know, Michael, I would say, well done for stringing those sentences together. Um, there's some sophisticated things going on there. And, um, but I do, dis I do have to disagree with you in a couple of places. Um, and one of them would be uh, what you suggested about the greatest scientists being those who don't believe in God. I can give you two examples, although there are many. Um, the two that immediately came to mind, one is... Einstein? Uh, well, I, he was baffled by I, the universe. Uh, for me, Einstein... Uh, Sorry. Is it, is it all right, is it all right if ahead, I go, just continue? continue? Okay, all right. And, um, you know, one of them would be Ard Louis, who's an outspoken theist. He's the director of graduate studies in physics at Oxford University. Um, another would be Francis Collins, who directed the Human Genome Project of Mapping Human DNA. He's also a theist. Those are just two examples. There are many. And the fathers of my, modern science, mm -hmm. almost all of them were theistic, including Isaac Newton, mm -hmm. who discovered gravity. If you read the introduction to Principia Mathematica, uh, the principles of the natural sciences, you will see that he actually wrote that to persuade the thinking man to believe in a deity. He says that... Mathematics is a language with which God has written the universe. Yeah. That, that's it's the universe. Who, who is that? Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, yeah. right. Is that in the introduction as well? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yes. But you won't hear that in your science class, probably. Um, but the... It's in Donald and Math Magic Land, which is a Disney thing that takes a look at science. It's, it's wonderful. You should well, watch it. Twice. I will watch it. I will watch it. I, I do like Disney, so we've got that in common too, Matt. Um, Disney movie night. Later. Um... <laughs> 
the, we're uh, going to dress up like <laughs> Disney princesses later, and nobody's going to... Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. But just to finish some comments, um, and I'll keep this brief. Um, the, the one You said there's not a question that science can't answer, or, or that the science... The, the, uh, in science, the questions are... Or in, excuse me. In atheism, the questions are limited. I, I think... The, one of the beauties of the of the Christian faith is that actually questions are permitted. Any question is permitted, and you can ask God any question honestly, and He welcomes that. And we see examples in Scripture. But the one question that science cannot answer is why science works in the first place. It's math. You, it's well, but we can't answer also why. I mean, Eugene Wigner, who was a mathematician, mm -hmm. um, wrote a seminal work called "The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and Sciences." And I, you, you mentioned Einstein. He's kind of famous for having said. The, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Science does not explain why science works. It's assumed that it does. It's observed that it does, but it cannot substantiate the reason why. And, and rather than going with the back and forth, I'll say that I'm in almost complete agreement. Um, although I'd say that science is predicated on math, which is predicated on logic, and there's where the presupposition comes in, that it's as useful as it, and, and these methods are as useful as they demonstrate. Um, but also, to tie into what you said, uh, both earlier when you talked about Christians doing wonderful things in universities, absolutely no question about it, uh, although that's independent from whether or not there are reasons for it or the, or the religion itself is true. But there are plenty of brilliant scientists uh, who are religious in a variety of things. Absolutely. I think that my only point is that if you get to the reason why they believe in a god, it has nothing to do with science and is in some cases antithetical, like Francis Collins is a Christian in part because he came across a waterfall that was frozen into three, which reminded him of the Trinity, which convicted him. And so this was more of a, a spiritual trance. It's not like in pursuing the human genome, he came to uh, evidence for God. But, but I also think he probably has reasons beyond that experience for yeah. why he believes that it's true. Yes. But thank you, thank you so much, Michael. Well, thank, thank you for, for your question. Yes. Appreciate it. Hi, my name is Larry, and uh, I have a question for Matt. Uh, first, first off, I gotta say I really appreciate your answers. Oh, thank the, you. The, your viewpoints are very well thought through, and you're very articulate. Um, and I sense I'm, a butt coming. No, no, no. I'm I'm a, I'm a scientist, and I appreciate hearing all that. Thank you. Uh, the question I have has to be with uh, the atheist view of morality, and uh, which I'm sure you've been asked time and time again. Um, so when it comes to morality, I guess there's, I don't know if there's one atheist view or no. many atheists have different views. Yes. The, the views that I understand is that, you know, there's some common moral values through all people or all mankind, um, which would be maybe a Christian viewpoint that God's imposed that. I've also heard that that from an atheist view could be, you know, like DNA has replicated or something is... As, as we're evolved, you know, is within the brain that everybody has the same type. You don't kill people, you don't torture, you know, those type of things. Uh, so, so I don't know if that's part of the atheist view. The other one... Not would mine. Be, huh? Not mine. Okay. Uh, the other one would be, you know, that you define your own moral values to live by. And you've said it a few times that your actions have that's consequences not mine to both yourself. Okay. That's, that's a okay. subjective morality, yeah. Okay. And, and so, so yeah, so if that's true, then how does that work with, with you know, people who view that their view has to be right and they have to kill others sure. you know, to make their view right? So anyway, if you could explain that. I will do this as quickly as possible. First of all, I've given a talk, which is available on YouTube. Just mm -hmm. Google superiority of secular morality, and it will kind of give a rundown of my view of morality. I, I don't think morality is subjective. I think it is, in fact, objective, or at least what we care about is morality. Along with Sam Harris, I use well-being, however ill-defined it is, as the foundation that exists that we care about. Because if I lop off your head, absent some demonstration that it's good for you, uh, that's bad. That is not in the interest of your well-being. We are physical beings in a physical universe that dictates the consequences of our actions. So it's not just a matter of opinion about whether or not it would be harmful to you to lop your head off, uh, which I won't do, by the way, because, you know, Recognizing this, good. you could construct a, an entire moral system beginning with completely arbitrary foundations. You could, you could begin with death is preferable to life as one of your foundations, and you would quickly find out that this is not conducive to well-being because we'd all be dead. Um, and so you, the nice thing about a secular moral system is that you can start with arbitrary foundations, you build off of it, and you see what kind of society you get. You, cannot, you don't have to do this 
literally. You can also do this hypothetically. We can be thought experiments. Thought experiments. And the, the bigger point for me is that there is not a single objection to a secular moral system that is in any way solved by a religious one. Um, you could say, well, subjective morality. You think this is wrong and somebody else doesn't. How do you resolve that? Well, pointing to a god doesn't resolve it either. Whether, whether you're going with divine command theory, which is that something is moral or immoral because God says so, or whether you're just doing it with this is consistent with God's nature. It's still just an appeal to what the foundation is. And so recognizing that my actions have consequences, that I have to share space, and I can begin with life is generally preferable to death, health is generally preferable to sickness, you know, those sorts of things. And then you can start, I'm not going to pretend that anybody with any moral view has solved all the moral problems of society or has even got a robust enough system to do so. I just, and, and it's too much to go into here, but I, I don't think it's difficult. I don't think morality is nearly as difficult as people make it. Uh, as a matter of fact, we end up arguing, well, why should well-being be the source of morality? Okay, maybe it's not. But I care about well-being, you care about well-being. We can construct a system that essentially addresses that well-being thing. And then you need to show me something that's missing that is part of what you would call morality. Because as far as I can tell, this encompasses all of it. I guess I think of, um, with that argument, I think of someone like Marx and, and Mao, Stalin, who are very, uh, their communist viewpoint is that it's good for the society, good for the whole. To, to have communism imposed. Yes. And in order to impose that, we have to kill some of the people who don't follow or don't believe that, so in future generations, it'll be a lot more solid foundation. Yes, yeah, somebody could so, reach so, that conclusion, except that we now know that's not the case. That we know that this isn't necessarily good for all people, and we also can't go with the ends justify the means thing. So one of the, some of the key foundations that I have in, in what I would call a robust moral secular moral system, are notions of individual sovereignty and autonomy, uh, the basic freedoms that we cherish and value, and that you should start with, there's two things you could do. You start with you have no freedoms and only the ones we grant you, or you can have all freedoms and then we just limit them based on good reason. The second one turns out to be the better way to do things because it could take you forever. You, how do you even start the first one? Do I have freedom to grant myself more freedoms? It's a, it's a non-starter. We live now with the benefit of people who have lived many lives before us and seen the mistakes they made. Merely the fact that a moral system is secular does not mean that it's going to lead you to correct understandings. But a robust moral system, the one that I'm advocating, that is non-subjective, which means it's not just a matter of somebody's whims, it's appealing to facts about reality, the facts about what is in our best interest and not, that allows for the revision of those views when we find out, you know what, we tried this and holy cow, it made everything worse. So clearly we made a mistake and we can go back and review that. Religious systems don't have that. Thou, thou shalt not kill, while I'm generally in agreement with how it's portrayed, is not particularly robust. If you read through you know, laws related to killing people, there's murder one, murder two, murder three, manslaughter, blah, 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 because we understand that life's more complex than that. Thou shalt not steal. There's, not, there's nothing in there that's revisionary at all. And so if I steal a loaf of bread, have I stolen? Yes. Was it wrong? Maybe. What if it was after Katrina where all that stuff was going to go to waste and the most moral thing that I could do would be to steal that loaf of bread to feed people? I'm, I'm still a thief, but is it morally wrong? Is it morally wrong for me to break the glass in front of a, a window in order to get to a defibrillator to help somebody who's dying? My view of morality is situational, and non-subjective, that you need to evaluate. You set your goals, you evaluate the consequences of your actions with respect to those goals, and you revise the system constantly so that you are continually working to make a better world. And it's not perfect. Yeah, thank, thanks for your question. Okay. Thank you so much. We're, we're going to try to get to all these people in line. Yeah, we'll try I will best. be shorter, but morality is <laughs> not a brief question. Not, not a brief topic. It, we could have had an entire evening. I have lots to say to you about that. Matt. Yes. <laughs> And I'm sure Please it state your name and your question. Hi, my name is Debbie, and thank you both for being here. It's very enlightening. Um, I have a question for Matt, and you may have answered this, but um, in a little bit more simplistic terms, I'd like to ask. In light of the, uh, about morality, okay. uh, in light of the increase in frequency and severity of school shootings and bullying, 
and teen suicide? If there is no God, no divinity, how can we teach our children that they possess a spark of divinity and inheritance with the divine and that divinity exists in everyone they meet? If they know that, how could they kill our children? How so? So this kind of speaks to moral relativism. If there is no God, if there is no absolute truth, no absolute good, what is the detriment to doing evil? Okay. Okay. Uh, we can teach children that they have value as human beings. I mean, secular humanism is all about the fact that we at least have value to each other and to ourselves. Um, but are they divine? Can we teach them that they're divine? I don't know. I why. mean, that they that they possess a spark of divinity and that that is what they're supposed to live for, that that's what they're supposed to give and share and be. I, I don't know that I would use the word divine, um, but I'm fine with notions of dignity and value, mm -hmm. uh, which may be all you mean. I don't know. No, for, that's for me, not what all I mean. Okay. Well, okay. then I don't know why I would ever teach someone they're divine if I didn't have any reason to think that the divine existed. Right. So, Okay. That's that's my point. Okay, if that, the divine do, if the divine need... doesn't exist, then you don't then you're not divine. Can I can I chime in on here? Is that, is that okay yeah. with you? Um, I, I think I understand your question, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna take a stab at kind of sure um, or an attempt to phrase this back to you. Um, it seems to me what you're asking is that if if as a parent, um, you know. We look at, at, at the situation with our with youth in the United States, and we see that there are problems that seem mm -hmm. could be solved if those people understood that the person that the people around them have some kind of um, inherent worth or value. And, they're and, and, made in the image and likeness of God. Right, and I think, and I was assuming that's kind of what you meant. And and I would be careful with the phrasing, j just to just um, mm -hmm. for cl for clarity when you're thinking about this as well. Um, Jesus was divine, but we don't necessarily. We don't necessarily bear divinity. We bear the mark of God in the image of God, but I would mm -hmm. be careful about that term divine mm -hmm. as if we have any kind of divine nature. We don't. Mm -hmm. Jesus did. God does. Um, we don't. Um, but I think I understand what you mean because you mean the, the image of God. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I think, and I'd be curious to hear, you know, Matt, you respond to this too, and so I'm going to maybe say some things that you can feel free to, to chime in. But, um, you know, I, I, think your, I think your point is valid in that... Um, one of the things, you know, and Matt, as you were talking about the last point on morality, secular humanism, you know, really the, the highest good, it seems to me that the highest good is, is human flourishing by means of progress. And there are different kinds of progress, but progress seems to me um, in secular humanism to be defined as, as knowledge increase, increases, then humanity benefits from that and progress will be result, the result. That somehow as knowledge increases, the betterment of humanity is an outworking of that happening and that, and that progress is really the, the aim. And, and the problem I have with that is that there's actually nothing about the increase of knowledge that changes what seems to be a universal human disposition to have the capacity to harm other people or devalue them. And it seems to me that it's a flimsy framework, just sort of this like multiple trials attempt to construct a moral argument because who's to say that anybody should ever buy into that? And if your definition of human flourishing, or let's say for the next two centuries, there's a fixed definition of what it means to be human flourishing, but two centuries later, there's some kind of terminal illness that shows up on the earth, you know, some kind of um, you know, pandemic. And it turns out that, you know what, maybe it's best just to kill off everybody who has it so we can you know, eliminate that immediately. If, if that's what happens then, there's no framework to say that humans are inherently valuable. Why not just get to that point and, and allow human beings to flourish if that's ultimately the end goal? And I think I agree with your assertion that there must be, it, well, that it's, uh, there, it's not that there must be. You don't have to believe in what you're talking about to not kill people. You don't have to believe in the image of God. I kill exactly are... as many people as I want to, to borrow a phrase from Penn Jillette, which is zero. Right, and, and, I, and I don't think, as a Christian, I would never assume that as an atheist you would want to or be more predisposed you know, to, do, or to having a desire to kill yeah, people. This is, this is why I was trying to address the question, irrespective of the, of the word divinity. Thank you for your question. For, yeah, Appreciate thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sorry. Keep going. So yeah. irrespective of the word divinity, uh, I don't think that the notion of divinity or the notion of any kind of, that you don't need a God or even a belief in a God to have reasons to not do harm. And first of all, 
I, w I would encourage you to go look at the statistics because if you go through like Steven Pinker's book, Better Angels of Our Nature, we're living in the best of all possible times and despite the increase in reporting of things, things aren't actually getting worse. Uh, we're just reporting on some of the worst, but it's undeniable this stuff should, the number of school shootings should be zero in an ideal world. The number of shootings should be zero in an ideal world. There's no objection to a secular moral system, even, even the one you're saying, what happens in countless years? What if something changes? Well, if it changes, it changes, and you deal with it. it that's not resolved by appealing to a god. It's not, but I think that the point that I would make as a Christian, and I think that the thing that, I, that the outlook that a Christian has about human dignity is that you can say, um, and it's not because um, I need a God to be able to say that humans are, have dignity. I think you and I would both agree that even if that weren't a consideration, that there is a sense that we should dignify other, other humans around us. And I, I don't think you have to appeal to God to have that predisposition. I do believe that you have to appeal to some kind of, kind of transcendent objective source to justify that as a fact. I think if without that reference point, it is merely an opinion. So state okay. your name and, and your question. Thank you, yeah. guys. My name is Dan. I appreciate great insight from both y'all. Uh, my question, you kind of touched on, as most of these questions kind of overlapping. Um, I've seen a ton of brokenness that's gone unhealed. I've actually seen a ton of divine miracles as well, just my nature, a lot of work I'm in. Can you step up the mic just a little yeah. bit? Yeah. yeah. Um, and aside from me growing up kind of with a skeptic point of view, I've come in full acceptance to Jesus Christ and Christian. Um, and through all these things I've seen back and forth, my question kind of hopefully with both of y'all is how would science or an atheist that sees a miracle that cannot be explained by science? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, for, for how would science or an atheist that sees a miracle that cannot be explained by science, how would that not jeopardize your whole foundation of science? And how would you answer that? And then on the flip side, um, for the miracle, I'd say miracle, is what does it take for God, what is a recipe for a miracle for who God chooses to have a miracle for compared to the people that with a brokenness where the miracle does not actually occur? Like how does God choose that or what is a recipe for that miracle to happen? Michael, do you have a grasp of that question? I, I think so. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think I do. Um, yeah. it's a, it, I'll, I'll be honest, so I'll answer the second portion or attempt to answer the second portion. It, it's a bit of a hard question to answer um, because I, I do believe in miracles. I do believe in the supernatural. I think um, that um, it is not easy to say why you know, a supernatural event or a miracle or a healing would happen in one incident, instance and not in another or for one person and not the other. Um, some people, I have a, a, a dear friend, and I don't think he would mind me mentioning him here, um, a dear friend who passed away within the last year um, of a terminal illness, and he fully believed he would be healed. He had full trust, he had full trust that God had the ability to heal him or to even resurrect him. He had full, and he, he believed that on the basis of confidence in the fact that Jesus had been resurrected. And he was confident about that position on the basis of reasons and evidence. Now, in his life, that didn't happen. But it didn't change his view of God, knowing he believed that God could, but he didn't, he wasn't, um, he wouldn't have gone out and, and declared, God will do this. Um, he trusted in the goodness of God, whether or not he healed him or not. And I think that, um, you know, as, as, a, as a Christian, um, it can be confusing as to when God intervenes and when he does not. Um, but if God does exist, and I believe that he does, and if his nature is good, and I believe that his, it is, then, and, I, and, and the kind of trust that I have in him, I, I, I'm willing to wait till eternity to have some of those questions answered. And so that's, that's a bit of a non-answer, and I'm sorry for that. I don't know why that happens in some instances, and it doesn't. I wish... Um, there, there are obviously instances where, where you and I probably both, both wish something did, but I think that um, the assurance and the hope that we can have as Christians um, from Revelation 21 is that there is a promise that God has done something about all of those infirmities or injuries or whatever they are, and that they will be taken care of one day when all tears are wiped away. There will be no more mourning or crying, for the old things have passed away. Sure. And, and to do the one about how would science or an atheist respond to a miracle that they couldn't explain? 
Uh, in the past, there were things that we thought were supernatural, and what, every time we found out what they actually were, it's never been supernatural. That does, that's not an argument against the supernatural, it just means that what science does when it comes up against something it doesn't know or can't explain, is it attempts to explain, and if it can't, then there's no explanation from science. It doesn't break science. Now, if we were to confirm supernatural causation, if somebody were to demonstrate that the supernatural was real, that it could have an effect on reality, and that there could be this causal chain, then that might well be rolled under as a scientific discipline if, if it were to reach that kind of standard of evidence to show, oh, you know, we thought magnetism was magic, and we thought, you know, lightning came from Zeus and all these other things, and then we found out Oh, there's chemistry, we just, we just didn't know anything about it, but now we have a better understanding of chemistry and we know how reliable it is. We, we have a number of scientific disciplines. It's not impossible that if the supernatural were real, it would become a scientific discipline if we could demonstrate it reliably. But the fact that science can't explain something doesn't break science because science doesn't begin with the notion that we can explain everything or that we can explain it all right now. Thank you for your question, Matt. Just can I ask one follow-up question, kind of in the spirit of what the young man was asking. So from your viewpoint, um, like a transform life, how do you explain like how do you explain that? Like someone that testifies of God changing their life, you know, they're headed one direction and they totally turn around. Do you would you term that a miracle or how would you see that? Is it just a behavior? No, thing? because I've not only seen but I have experienced a transformed life that is in the opposite direction. Yeah. You know, my, my views on, on things have changed. My life now is, com is, is in many ways vastly different than it used to be. Okay. I also know, you know, people, th this comes up a lot with like um, addiction issues, but we know that people have transformed their lives. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't, we can't say that it wasn't without the intervention of God, but they're not crediting a God with it. There's no way to demonstrate it. And so uh, these two people both have a substance abuse problem. They both come through uh, and are now completely uh, no, no longer dealing with that substance abuse problem. They've transformed their lives and are helping other people, and one of them gives credit to God, and the other one gives credit to the actions that they actually took. I don't have any way to see, say either one of them are wrong. I just don't see any evidence of an interaction of a God or a requirement for it. Right. Things can change. Next question. Well, Pastor Rob just teed up my whole oh, thing. Oh, Travis? I know yeah, Travis. I'm Travis. Yeah. And uh, yeah, 20 years clean and sober, completely Congratulations. Uh, a, a crazy life. Um, but I had a lot of purpose in my life. And when the question was asked, what is the meaning of life? When you were talking, Michael, I was thinking, man, I hope he answers that. What is the purpose of life? And then you answered it. What is the purpose of life? And I was like, oh, boy, this is confusing. But what I realized <laughs> we is... We planned that. Uh, we, uh, well, what I realize is you kind of, and I want to clarify this, because this first debate, I haven't even really uh, read much on atheism. I just know my life has changed. And um, I, I guess you take out the supernatural. There is no, there is no, po the supernatural doesn't exist. No, that's so, not. I don't begin with the supernatural doesn't exist. Okay. I begin with I'm not yet convinced that it does, and if you want to claim it as a cause, you need to demonstrate that it is. Okay, so let me just get to my one question. Okay. Yeah. Could you define supernatural? Good question. Sure. Anything that is not a part of the natural world. Okay. Could you define supernatural? I, I would use the, the same definition, and maybe some examples would be... Um, you know, anything that can't be explained or measured by the scientific method. So if it's not a natural thing, I mean, it, one of one of the, uh, you know, it, it would be, for example, you know, there's the claim that Jesus turned water into wine um, at the wedding at Cana. And, you know, you could test that water to see if it was H2O mo molecules beforehand. After the fact, it would have been something different. But there's no scientific method to really obtain what exactly happened in that moment of transformation from one chemical composition to another. Okay. Would or it be the addition a, would, of Would the, it be a chemicals. true statement to say that your view on purpose is external, you, de, you define it, and your view on, ex, on purpose is given an internal... I, I think you switched the words. Yeah. I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you know, maybe, no. maybe it would help. You know, you, you, the way you started the question, I think, is helpful to kind of know maybe what you're... What you're thinking about meaning and purpose. I mean, if you take from me per personally, and sure. I'm just going to stop here, if you take the 
internal experience out of Christianity, then, then I'm not who I am today. If you take that away, there's no argument. I can't argue my view. Now, because I know what's happened in my life internally and how my purpose has changed, I know something exists. See, I go to the scriptures now almost to confirm what I have rather than to go try to figure out what to get. Does that? Does yeah, that? Th- yeah, thank you, Travis. So, so I, I again, it's can, a transform life you know, right. testimony. Yeah, yeah and, and so first of all, congratulations on being clean and sober. Whether a God did it or you did it, I'm happy. Um, the other thing is that I, I've said many times, if, if someone is convinced that the only thing that's keeping them from being bad is that they believe in a God, I want you to stay in church. I want you to keep believing. I want you to keep doing If that's the only thing that's doing it, the problem is, no, no, I'm not saying that with yeah. regard to you. I'm just saying if somebody thinks that this is the cause, then it doesn't matter whether or not it's real if that's the only thing that's going to convince them. Because we know that people can be convinced by something that's not true. You can, uh, you can think that you're doing better because you've got your lucky socks. And it may not be true that they're lucky socks, but as long as you're convinced of it, you are staying sober. Right. It, you can think that it's because of a God. I can't, those are unfalsifiable propositions. I can't believe, prove your socks aren't lucky. I can't prove that there's not a God that's, that's giving you the internal support all the time. That's a, there's a difference between your internal experience and that this concept is motivating you to be a better person that is separate from this concept is actually true because there are you can have transformative experiences from a number of different things including things we know to not be true and it is in one case now if you've tried different socks for 10 years <laughs> that's still not it yeah. suddenly you no that's Right. I think I needed a new pair of that's, socks. Yeah. Um, I, I'm Michael, sorry, but, but that's that, just a fact. But Travis, you know, j- I, I promise to keep this brief, brief sir, because I know you're, you've been waiting so patiently. Um, I, I believe that what you, you have experienced is profound and that it is an, an incredible thing. And one of the things, you know, as you continue to make sense of your experience, you know, you, you have, I, I commend you for exploring that, for seeking that out, but it seems that that from, from what you have experienced, there is a power in your life that has overcome another power that you maybe felt was too greater to overcome on your own. And one of the things, and I would say I have experienced that as well, not in the exact same way or form, but one of the claims of Christianity is that Jesus has the power to transform your desires, that he has the power to, to liberate yourself, you, liberate you from yourself. And um, I think it's that power that transforms not, that doesn't just necessarily satisfy, but changes our appetites to want to satisfy things that will truly fulfill us, that sets Christianity apart as, as a worldview and what it, what it um, sets out for, for, um, for Christians to be able to receive from the in, inward transformation of God. How do you tell the difference between somebody who's truly transformed by a God and somebody who just believes that they're transformed by a God? Well, there is a biblical criteria for that, and it would be referred to as the fruit of the Spirit. Are they bearing fruit? You know, Jesus talked a lot about how good trees bear good fruit, bad trees bear bad fruit. But when you're talking about like a moral, I mean, I, is it possible to get that confused? Yeah. I mean, you can change your outward moral behavior um, pretty easily. If you were committed to that or you were on a, 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 a for some reason, wanted to, well, I, I guess... I'm not sure if we're using an example where somebody's doing that duplicitously or somebody really sincerely wants to change their outward. Those, those two guys have completely changed. We both acknowledge they've changed. Sure. Um, how do I tell the difference between whether, how do I identify that that change is caused by God versus just caused by being convinced that God has changed them, whether he did or not? You know, I don't know that I am quick to make a pronouncement about that. I tend to give people uh, to trust them unless I have a reason not to. Um, but I think that there is a, that it's not, when, when you're thinking about becoming a Christian, that it doesn't just have to do with change or transformation. It has to do with um, the means of that by, that, by which that happens. And if somebody had, got, had gone to Jesus or gone to God and, and in, in a um, posture of repentance and need, the promise is that Jesus will meet those needs. And I think that if they have taken that avenue and received that, then um, I had, would have no reason to question um, whether or not um, they, that, that God was involved in that transformation. 
Let, let me uh, just say before our next question, real quick. Um, we uh, we said that we were going to go till nine o'clock, and you can see by your watches it's nine o four. Can I have your permission to extend this to nine fifteen? Would that be all right? Because I feel bad for these people been standing. And I also want to say uh, there was a card. I think it was on your chairs. I think is it on your chairs? And uh, if for any reason we don't get to the end of this line in the next uh, 11 minutes, which I think we might not, to <laughs> this card is uh, really valuable. You can see that you can put your name and your email, even if you want your phone number. And you notice there's a couple options here. I'd be interested in continuing the conversation. Uh, I'd be interested in exploring faith. I'd like to know about future events, suggestions, for, uh, and feedback. So even as these, uh, these folks are standing here to ask their questions, take a minute, if you would, to be filling that in. And um, I, I have a guarantee that you'll be followed up. Someone will follow up with you. And uh, it, whether it's Matt or it's Michael, uh, there'd be a great joy in answering uh, your responses here. So make sure you do that. And uh, you can, where do they leave that, uh, Brad? On the seats. Just leave it on the seat where you are. So please, state okay, your name real and your quick. question. My name is Doug. I guess you could say I'm a sciencey kind of guy, but I'm not immune from having philosophical arguments. And to some degree, I would say that a lot of what we're talking about tonight is kind of parsing philosophy. Now, I don't, I don't mean cheapen it too much, but there's a lot of philosophy going on in here. Personally, I kind of wanted to go to the core, and I started reading books like Darwin's Black Box, Darwin's House of Cards, Undeniable, the how biology confirms our intuition that life is designed. And it's kind of opened my eyes a lot about how the science world has maybe done me a disservice over the years in not really allowing other interpretations and discoveries that, in my mind now, kind of are evidence that things are designed, that biology, in fact, tells us that on a micro, you know, super DNA kind of a level in the, the best ways we understand that stuff. My question is, have you guys read those books? How, what statement do you have about how science is positioned in, you know, being a fair input to this argument of God existing or not or that type of thing? I've read some of those books. Um, for a long time, DNA evidence wasn't allowed in court because it hadn't demonstrated an efficacy, and it probably did a disservice to people. And as soon as it demonstrated an efficacy, it was allowed in court. Science works pretty much the same way. As soon as these issues of the supernatural demonstrate some sort of efficacy, they'll be pursued within science just like anything else. And if it's ultimately done a disservice, that is about what the end result is. It's not about whether or not there's a sound epistemology to consider these as potential candidate explanations. Michael? Um, I have... Uh, read, I don't know that I've read any of them entirety. I kind of practice a predatory reading approach because there is so much out there. Um, so I try to be intentional about that. And, but um, I, I think I understand your question. Um, is there a role for the natural sciences in, come in thinking about the existence of the supernatural, which the science isn't necessarily concerned with? Um, I, I don't know that I believe that the sciences can have any kind of uh, method to um, empirically prove that the su supernatural exists. There are two different things, the natural world, the supernatural. I don't know that, but I do believe you can look at the natural sciences and see sign pointers of something. A, a small example of that, and again, this does not prove the existence of God, but it was the order in the universe that really propelled thinking men to look for that kind of, they looked for that kind of consistency because they had the assumption that God created it and then they found it and that was consistent with their assumption. But the more that I think we discover um, through the natural sciences, it is, there is a baffling com complex order to biological life, to or organic biological life, I think abiogenesis in and of itself, which doesn't have a natural explanation. The fact that biological life exists the term we use in Latin is abiogenesis. In other words, life, the beginning of life from no life. I mean, the term itself is almost a contradiction, but we talk about it with a massive assumption that natural sciences have a huge assumption that that happened because maybe some lightning bolt struck the primordial ooze or something. We don't have a natural explanation for that. And I think that there are certain things like that, certain massive assumptions in the natural sciences that I don't think that 
at least, I can't speak for sciences, not all scientists, but I can speak for certain atheistic scientists who are actually, they don't necessarily subscribe to merely atheism, they also subscribe to scientism, which is the belief that science really is the only way that you can come to know something with certainty and it must be demonstrated either um, analytically or th through the scientific method. That leaves us with a lot of unanswered questions if that's the only criteria we have. You cannot answer why music is, is and, and art is beautiful. You can't talk about love. You can't talk about really anything existential and you definitely can't talk mor about morality. Thanks so Great. much for Thank your you. question. Next question. Hi, my name is Kat. Hi, Kat. Hi, Kat. I have some really short questions. Um, for Matt, um, so forgive my ignorance. With atheism, what I'm hearing is you just believe you're a body. You don't have a spirit or a soul. Is that correct? So I'm going to be mildly pedantic for yes just or a no. second. Yes or no. <laughs> We have a new moderator. No, that's not what atheism means in any sense. Okay. So you, what do you, you're not just a body, so do you have a spirit? I don't or believe a soul? that I have a spirit or a soul, but so that's not atheism. Okay. Atheism is only about the issue of whether or not there's a God. Do you believe you have a spirit and a soul? No. Okay. Have you ever had a spiritual experience? I, I don't even know what that means because the word spiritual gets used to point to so many different things that I think the word is pretty much useless. If, if, you, want to, if you want to ask me, if you want to give me an example of a spiritual experience or what you're calling a spiritual experience, then I could say yes or no. Have you ever had an experience that you can't explain? I've had loads of experiences that I can't explain. And I, and, and I don't like the fact that I can't explain them, but that doesn't mean I'm justified in asserting a supernatural explanation or a God as an explanation, the right answer sometimes is I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have one more question. Sure. Um, there was some confusion to me um, whenever, I don't even know what the question was anymore, but it was about um, maybe the purpose of life or the meaning of life and whether it was external or internal. And I just got really co confused by both of your answers. So my question is actually for you, Michael. Um, if our relationship, if you believe in God and you have a relationship with God, that's only something that can happen internally. So then it's not an external force, actually, God's purpose for your life. It's actually an internal force because you can only know God by having a relationship with him. So um, when, when, we're, when we think about, or when I think about um, meaning and purpose, um, meaning and purpose are almost synonymous, but not quite the same thing. Um, to have meaning means that I have a purpose and that it matters. That's what, that's what to live a meaningful life is. So it's, it's intrinsic to meaning to live a purposeful life. And you can, you can look at that, you know, an example that isn't involving God would be owning a pet. And there are a lot of people who find meaning because merely, I mean, even it will lower suicide statistics by just owning a pet because you wake up in the morning and there's a purpose that matters for another creature that you're cohabitating with. I mean, that, that is an example. Um, but when, I, when we're talking about why, what makes, you know, in Christianity, what makes meaning different and what is actually sort of external, internal, I don't really think about it. The, the terms that I, that way, the terms that I would use is, is it discovered? Or is it created? And I would say that as a Christian, um, I believe that meaning really, there is a true objective meaning that we discover and that actually can discover us because truth is a person embodied in Jesus Christ. Whereas in an atheistic perspective, I think that meaning is entirely created. And there are some people, Matt talked about how that's a liberating thing for him. There are many others who have talked about how it's abs the biggest burden ever. If you read any of the existentialists, you read mm -hmm. um, Sartre, I mean, he wrote Nausea, which is a, a novel about a man in, in the search for meaning and, and what that actually, how crippling that was. If you look at the people, you know, in other areas of the world where they have zero upward, uh, zero upward mobility or opportunity, it's going to be very hard for them to create a narrative of meaning that they can live with. As Christians, we know that actually meaning does exist and that we can encounter that meaning, we can align our lives with it, and that it leads to human flourishing. 
Cool. I'm sorry to hog the microphone, Matt. No, that, thank you for your question. One last question. Since you have the unique position of having been maybe, maybe a Christian, um, did you ever have a spiritual experience when you believed that you could have a spirit? I definitely had experiences that I would have described at the time as spiritual. I okay. no longer have reason to think that's accurate. Awesome. I was just curious. Thank Thanks. you, Kat. Uh, listen, let's just take one more question, and then I have a closing question. So, All right. Please. My, uh, my name is Chris. Thank you, Sorry. Austin. And, and w I think we're happy to stick around a little bit and chat with anybody who didn't get yeah. asked. I think, Matt, yeah. you're okay with that. Too. Yeah. yeah. That sounds great. I just cut, so that works yeah. perfect. So, you, um, you cut in line? No, I was oh. allowed to cut. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> So, so I often wonder cut. how two honest what? About morality <laughs> there you go. So I often wonder how two honest smart people can come to dramatically different conclusions when looking at the same evidence. Uh, we often become entrenched in our own opinions, and we look to our experiences and the evidence to confirm our beliefs on things. So I'm curious for both of you, and specifically Michael. I think Matt, you've answered this to some extent, but what evidence could be presented to you that you think would be compelling enough to reconsider your belief? If somebody could produce remnants of the body or the bones of Jesus, I would not be a Christian. And um, how would but you? but they yeah. won't yeah. because his body isn't it wasn't there then and it's not here now. Um, it's also true that they won't if he didn't exist or it's not. Like, this is an unfalsifiable proposition. Somebody well, else has come up with this too. Well, I mean, I I don't. I think it's a little unfair to make the assertion that Jesus didn't exist. Because, I'm not asserting that. Okay, I'm saying okay. That it's true because under almost that nobody does. But in, in the instance, just to answer your question fully, and then, and then I do welcome your feedback here, Matt. Um, yeah, I mean, the, Paul, who arguably founded the church, um, was bold enough to say, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then we are to be pitied most among men. And if you look at the first century and what the lives of followers of Jesus looked like, it was not a pretty picture. It was a pretty rough go for a long stretch there. And he did that saying, look, like we, we have this living hope, this hope that, that there is something more than life here, that actually there is um, a hope beyond death, beyond circumstances, beyond torture, beyond whatever it is that happens to them because they're proclaiming the resurrection and sharing this hope with other people. Um, and he's, what he's saying is that... Um, Ultimately, if, if, it were, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then there's no way to validate that hope, that it's actually just wishful thinking at that point. But I think the reason that I believe that he was raised from the dead and that that's verifiable is, one, I do believe there were eyewitnesses to this. I do believe that the New Testament writers consulted eyewitnesses to this event. I find it incredibly compelling that in a very short period of time before Constantine became the Roman emperor, so I'm not talking about the expansion by the Roman Empire, but in that first window of time after Jesus is claimed to have lived, died, and been resurrected, that overnight you have Jews, Greeks, pagans, um, you know, I don't, I don't know, whatever other religions that existed in the culture at the time, becoming followers of Jesus overnight and being willing to follow him to their death. And it's, that doesn't prove that God exists or that he was raised from the dead, but what I think it does strongly suggest is that they really confidently believe that it was true that he was raised from the dead and I think it's um, that that's compelling and you know as Blaise Pascal the inventor of the cal calculator put it I will trust a witness who will get his throat slit um, in other words liars make bad martyrs mm -hmm. if you really don't believe something you're probably not going to stick your neck out for it and in a very small window of time you've got thousands of people going to their deaths confident that Jesus is who he claimed to be and that what he promised them was a hope beyond whatever they were facing at the time. That's pretty compelling to me. There are other things. I believe that Christianity is true on a cumulative case, but that's one thing that I think I find very interesting when considering that something very significant happened 2,000 years ago in Palestine. A man was raised from the dead. And yet, curiously, there are martyrs for many other beliefs, and they can't be correct. So we know that people, it's not that they have to die for a lie, it's that they have to die believing something. Okay, that's independent of whether or not the belief is correct. When you asked Michael what potential thing could change his mind, I, had, I, I did a debate in Canada where somebody gave pretty much the same answer, you know, produce the body of Christ. Well, that's not possible under any circumstance, uh, unless, unless maybe there's a God and Jesus comes down here right now, which is a really good question as to why that doesn't happen, because converting 
some of the, the most outspoken prominent atheists on the planet through a, a, an incredible sort of thing like that would seem to be beneficial, but maybe that's not part of his plan and that's fine. But at the end of the day, if what will change your mind is something that can never be produced, then you're basically saying, I won't change my mind. And I used to give, people would ask me, well, what would change your mind? And I used to give the glib answers of, well, if there was writing in the sky that everybody could read, irrespective of their language. But as Arthur C. Clarke pointed out, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So what I would have is writing in the sky. How do I know that that's from a god versus some technology that I don't understand? This is the key thing about skepticism, is if there is an event and we have competing propositions to explain it, we need some way to distinguish between the two, which is why I asked, how do you tell the difference between somebody who is actually transformed by God and somebody who just thinks they were? Because the outsider test for this is that they're the same. And so I had to change my answer. And my new answer for what will change my mind is probably not gonna be very satisfying, but it is intellectually sound and epistemologically sound. And that is, I don't know what would change my mind. It would be monumentally arrogant of me to presume that I could tell the difference between a God and, and a technology that these things I don't understand. I don't know what would change my mind. But if there is a God, that God absolutely knows what would change my mind and has not done that, which means either that God does not exist or that God does not want me to know that it exists yet. Either way, it's not my problem. Thanks thank for you, your question. Thank you. So I yeah, let's thank these guys for sure. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to I want to close with this this final question and maybe uh, a question that that you could answer, but also maybe attach to it any closing thoughts that you want as well. But uh, I'm going to read this because I think this is a very important question for everybody that's sitting here. Why would someone choose your, your worldview as an explanation of life as we know it? What's compelling about your worldview? So first of all, I'm not convinced that beliefs are the subject of choice. We don't choose our beliefs. Be believing something is the result of becoming convinced, and you can become convinced for good reasons or bad reasons. Um, the worldview that I would advocate isn't atheism. I mean, I, atheism is just, I'm not convinced there's a God. The things that I tend to talk a lot more about uh, are the foundations behind some of that, which is skepticism and humanism. And the reason that people can, and I would argue should, opt to be skeptical is if they care more about truth than comfort, if they want their internal model of reality to be as accurate as possible, if they want to avoid being wrong, to get back to my favorite philosopher of all time, David Hume, he famously has pointed out that if somebody comes to me and tells me that a man is raised from the dead, I have to ask the question of whether or not the thing is more likely to have occurred or that this individual might be deceived or attempting to deceive. And then he points out that we should reject the greater miracle. What he doesn't say is accept the lesser miracle. So if you reject the greater miracle, if it's more likely that somebody has been deceived or is trying to deceive than that somebody was raised from the dead, which, I mean, if you're gonna call it a miracle, you have to recognize that miracles are by definition the least probable things, then we reject this one. Not, we're not saying it didn't happen. We're not saying we're not willing to accept additional evidence, but we don't have to accept either one of the other two. It's not that, hmm, I've rejected this one, so you're a liar or you're trying to deceive me. I may not have enough evidence to reach those conclusions. Another aspect from Hume is this idea that uh, the wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. And it's basically saying that for any given belief, you have a confidence level of how strongly you accept that this is the case. And your confidence level should be proportional to the evidence that is for it. The biggest problem, I think, is not, I don't think Michael is likely to reject either of those principles it's in the nature of what we are and aren't willing to accept as evidence. How high are our evidentiary standards on certain things? And if I can't tell the difference between two propositions, I don't get to say, you know what? I really need to make a decision now. I'm just gonna go with the God thing because I've seen so many people's lives transformed or Christians have done so many wonderful things or it's spread relatively rapidly. All of those things address what people believe and what people believe is completely independent from what, whether or not that belief is true. 
The truth is not impacted in any way by the number of people who believe it, how strongly they believe it, how long they believe it, how long the idea has been around, or how willing they are to die for it. That has no impact on whether or not it's true. Now, in science, we don't have a notion of proof. That's a mathematics thing. And I don't think you can be absolutely certain about anything. But if the argument that one is making could not stand up in a court of law, under the fairly loose standards we have there, it's not always just beyond a reasonable doubt, sometimes to a preponderance of evidence, et cetera. If the evidence that you're using to accept the foundation of your life is something that would not be admissible in court, something that we have no way to test and investigate, it's something that we can't tell the difference between two claims, then my view is that you are making a mistake to accept it. I'm not saying that you should run around saying, there is no God, there is no supernatural at all. But to be honest in whether or not you have sufficient evidence to accept it. People have called the show, and one, of the, one question that came up years ago, and I'll, I'll finish with this. If God didn't create the universe, who did? There's a massive flaw in that question. You're presuming that the answer has to be a who. The correct question is, what is the explanation for the origin of the universe? That question allows you to answer with God, Yahweh, Allah. It allows you to answer with anything. And so as long as we keep asking the wrong questions, we don't have any confidence that we can reach the right answers. Science doesn't exclude those explanations because science is anti-supernatural. It excludes those explanations from candidate explanations currently because those explanations have not demonstrated any efficacy or reliability, which is what we find when we test intercessory prayer, which is what we find when we go and investigate miracles. We cannot currently, and perhaps forever, get there. And that's not the fault of science, and it's not the fault of logic or reason. A fallacy is a fallacy is a fallacy. And if your argument has unsound premises, and or an un invalid structure, then you cannot trust the conclusion. And I have yet, in all, all these years, it may happen to be presented with a compelling argument for God or the supernatural that is demonstrably sound and valid, supported by evidence. Doesn't mean there's no God, but that is the reason that I'm not convinced. And tomorrow, I can change my mind if the nature of that evidence and argument changes. That's what will change my mind. Sound arguments supported by evidence. I don't necessarily know what that is, but my mind can be changed. I, I, I cannot do the writing in the sky for the reasons I already explained. But it's not a closed-mindedness, and it's not a position of faith. It's just a recognition that, as far as I can tell, we're not there yet, and while I understand that some people are convinced that we are, and you're not stupid, I can't even say that you're wrong, we have to have the discussion about, if we start from a point of, of agreement about reality, we need to find the point at which we disagree. And it may be the case that that disagreement is forever intractable, that Michael will always accept the supernatural as a candidate explanation, and until something changes, I will never accept supernatural as a candidate explanation. And okay, I guess we're kind of maybe stuck there. But at least I'm not wrong. I may not have the right answer, but I'm not accepting the wrong answer. Thank you, Mark. Michael? Um, Blaise Pascal is, is I think, a, a brilliant writer. And if you haven't looked into his book, uh, Pensée, it's a series, it just means sayings in French. And he wrote a lot of little kind of quips or sayings or proverbs, if you will. And he's said several that I find very helpful. One of them is that um, the heart has its reasons of which reason knows not. In other words, as human beings, we don't, while I understand um, and I actually respect Matt's high standard for truth and evidence, I, I think that that is noble and I hope to be a person who values truth in great degree as Matt has so articulately um, laid out before you. 
But I also believe that as humans, we make many decisions in our lives that we would not otherwise make if the standard for evidence was that it had to be indisputably clear that it would not go one way or turn out to be something that we didn't expect. What's an example of that? We make decisions that are irrational all the time. A major one in the human experience is love relationships. There's probably nothing more irrational than the rom-com industry. It is mind-blowing. We are propelled by emotions, by reasons of the heart of which reason knows not, and that's not just in our relationships. I think it has to do with existential choices that we make on a regular basis. I think it has to do with the ways that we choose to live out our identity or do self or participate in self-expression. It's not always on the basis of cold, hard facts, although truth is critically important. Um, the second thing that Blaise Pascal said that I think is very compelling, he said there's enough light in faith for those who want to be able to see to see and enough darkness for those who don't. In other words, that he, what he's getting at is that the choo- the God is not ultimately interested in your intellectual assent that he exists. Belief actually to God, what does he really, he doesn't gain from that. God is not so insecure that he needs you to believe in him or else he's got sort of like, you know, like a chip on his shoulder. What he's interested in is a relationship with you that he paid a very high price to initiate by the sending of his son in exchange for a perfect life of lived given in exchange for lives, I'll speak for myself, a life of not live with perfect love, and that's putting it very mildly. Um, that is the exchange that was made. And it really, the, the, the decision to surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord is different than giving intellectual assent to him being who he claimed to be. I think there's a lot of people who acknowledge that Jesus is who he claimed to be, and they have no interest in coming under him as their king or their Lord. That's a very different thing altogether. That decision is a matter of the will, which I think Blaise Pascal is getting at, that ultimately there is a choice. And I think God dignifies all of us in a choice. He is not going to coerce you. He is not going to force you to choose. He has dignified you. I think it's part of being made in the image of God, that he allows you that choice. And then finally, I would say, why would somebody, and why am I compelled by the Christian faith? One more quote for reference. Clive Staples Lewis, C.S. Lewis, I think it's one of the most brilliant things. He made um, a huge transition in his thinking, the the reverse direction to you, Matt. Um, He was formerly an atheist. He called himself the most reluctant convert in the whole of England when he ultimately made that choice. And when he talks about why he's compelled by Christianity, this is what he said, and I find this um, extremely stirring. He said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not just because I see it, but because by it, I can see everything else. In other words, he was compelled by the light that was shined on his life and his experience and the experiences of people and the nature of our existence and the universe itself. In other words, it is a powerful, illuminating explanation. It's an inference to the best explanation to see the world that we live in and all the sign pointers for things that are transcendent. And to come to the and to, to acknowledge the fact that the Christian worldview powerfully explains our desires, our pursuits, our needs. And that and the, the claim of Christianity is that Jesus not only the, the Christianity not only explains them, but Jesus in relationship will satisfy those things most deeply. And that's a, that's a that's a falsifiable claim, but you better believe it's an invitation to each and every one of us. And my encouragement to you would be before you resign that exploration on insufficient evidence. Take seriously the possibility that God might exist and explore the person of Jesus for yourself. Draw your own conclusions. And if anybody here wants to talk about that, I would be more than happy to discuss with you. Thank you so much to both of you. Do you want to answer that, or, or, or the question was, where does you know? Let me do this. Uh, thank you for that question. <laughs> and, and you know what? There may not be an answer. Well, there, I, there, 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 I, there would be two. Let's go with that. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's an answer. <laughs> there, 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 there's a lengthy thing about what exactly do you mean by creativity? Is this something that actually exists? But, what, but I think what you mean, 
and my best guess, I see no reason to think that this isn't a product of our, our minds, our brains. It's a problem-solving thing. It is a byproduct of being able to assess things, coming up with more inventive solutions, trying to figure out whether or not the rustle that you heard in the bushes uh, was a, a creature or there was some other thing. Learning about the world allows us to investigate and explore that, that drives what we call creativity to produce things. I'll give Matt the last word tonight. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Yes, yes. Michael, Matt, thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, to, to use a biblical reference, Matt, uh, as the three of the apostles said, it's been good for us to be here tonight. So I'm glad to, to be here. And I uh, just want to remind you one last time, these cards are really important because through this communication, you can continue to have a conversation with both of these fellas, and that would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, once again, I want to thank Michael. I want to thank Matt. Let's show our appreciation to them once again. And just to remind you, uh, Think Week Austin Dot com. Go online and you can see other uh, gatherings this week. You don't want to miss out. I think it's going to be worthwhile. And finally, thank you so much for coming, spending your evening with us. We're grateful. Thank you. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.